Hi, my name is Mike and welcome back to the shop. This is episode 12.5 and it's part two of our um, horizontal and vertical uh, part assembly or construction. Uh, obviously we have uh, glued our trim pieces up and our blanks are ready to go. If you haven't seen part one of this, um, this part will make uh, absolutely no sense. So I'd go back and catch that. Uh, before we put our trim, uh, or rather our sheeting on, we need to uh, make sure there's no high spots in the glue. Every now and then that five minute epoxy that we use um, we'll have just a little tiniest bit of a high spot sticking up. A couple of things you want to keep in mind is don't use this coarse sandpaper way out here on the edge because you will diminish that uh, width out here. So what I am doing is, is just very carefully knocking down just the, the tiniest bit of um, uh, epoxy if there's a couple of little uh, droplets that are, that are hanging proud there of the balsa and it literally takes only about that long. So stay up here on the balsa. Don't drift down here onto the foam because you will uh, you'll take that foam away very, very quickly. And it just takes a, a tiniest little, little bit of effort there to get that perfectly smooth. And they are, so uh, I have taken some uh, three inch strips of 1 16th balsa and we'll take two of them because our piece uh, by no coincidence is exactly six inches wide and as a matter of fact uh, off camera I trimmed it to exactly six to match these two three inch pieces. So first thing we need to do is edge these two pieces up, get some glasses on so I can see. And we want to make sure that we have a nice even gap all the way across there and we do. So get them lined up right. And we do not need to edge glue these. Just take a uh, little pieces of blue painter's tape and just squeeze them together good. Use your hand as a clamp, pull them together. And uh, I don't know if you can see that there. There's just a tiniest bit of a gap here. It's not much at all. It's enough that I can easily pull together with my hand. Use that tape as a clamp and it holds it tight. We want no gap at all for that epoxy to, uh, to seep through because remember we're not edge gluing it. So there's one. That one's gonna be nice too. Get them lined up perfectly on the ends. And I have trimmed them to the exact length as well. Um, well, exact is relative. Uh, they can be within a, a sixteenth or an eighth. It doesn't really matter because remember we're going to trim those using our template later on the router. A little bit of a gap out here at the end. Squeeze it tight and there we go. All right, so I've put um, seven or eight drops of the red RIT dye in the epoxy and stir it up for a minute. Make sure, again, that you get it off the bottom of the cup here. Remember, that those cups have the little detent in the bottom, so uh, use your little stirring stick to uh, scrape it out of those, those little cup holes down there or those cup grooves. And we want to get, uh, see it's pretty deep in this cup, so we want to get that cup emptied as quickly as we can. Remember the uh, exothermic reaction from the epoxy generates heat, and that heat really accelerates um, the reaction in the, uh, speeds up the uh, reaction in epoxy. So the quicker you can get that stuff uh, spread out, the better. You will be able to uh, extend your working time with the epoxy greatly by just spreading it out. So get as much of it flat as you can and then you don't have to uh, worry about it kicking over there in that cup because uh, the deeper the cup, the uh, quicker it will kick and you'll actually feel the, uh, the heat generating pretty quick in that cup. And now that it's, it's pretty low we can relax and uh, certainly with it spread out across this balsa 
uh, we won't have any problem with it at all. And it's pretty cool down here. It's uh, about 62, 63 degrees, so we've got plenty of time once we get it flattened out and it's not uh, holding its own heat. It's able to radiate it off. And it's a good idea to make sure that you have all of your uh, equipment together or, or tools or whatever you're going to need to uh, do this before you mix the epoxy uh, and certainly before you start spreading it out. Um, so I have the vacuum bags uh, ready to go. Um, all of my, my tools I've gathered up. Um, there's nothing more aggravating than uh, getting the epoxy mixed and then realize you can't find the roller uh, or the little pads that go on the roller. And that has happened to me before, obviously. So that's pretty thick. Uh, that's a lot more epoxy than we want. So I'm going to take some of it off of there and just wet the top of this foam. I'm not, um, I'm not really spreading a lot on here. I'm just making sure that it gets wet so that the two surfaces do bond together better. And I'll uh, use this opportunity to take some of this epoxy off of this panel right here. You can see how it's picking it up off the panel onto the roller, and then I'm just depositing it off of the roller back onto the foam here. All right. And gently take one of our pieces of uh, fiberglass. This is a three quarter ounce, 0.75 ounce um, fiberglass cloth, and just lay it gently on top of our part. The more you handle it, of course, the, the weirder it gets out of shape. There we go. Oops, a little hair caught my glove. There we go. And just get it to lay down. We don't need to put any more epoxy on it. If you uh, roll it a few times, and be careful these little strands don't get hung up in your roller. I need to clean my roller off. It's got epoxy built up here. And that's catching some of those strands. All right, that's good enough for that one. Now, the trailing edge of this, uh, or the, the edge with the uh, uh, balsa strip on it, I do not want to trim any more than I have to. So I make sure that it is the edge that I'm lining up perfectly on the back of this uh, balsa sheeting. So I'm lining that side up perfectly. I'm getting the ends lined up. It's kind of split the difference because uh, the sheet is about an eighth inch longer than, than our blank here. There we go, and that'll do that. Slide that one to the side. All right, again, line it up perfectly with the back side or the edge with the uh, balsa on it. And I just put a couple pieces of tape on it to keep it from getting out of the perfect alignment that we've got it in now. Double check. That looks really nice. Set that one off to the side and we'll knock the other one out. All right, so we've got our two pieces uh, taped together and they look really, really nice. So I've got a piece of uh, 
uh, or actually two pieces of scrap MDF here. So I have also taken a, um, a couple of spacers. Uh, I've had to learn this uh, through trial and error. Uh, if your uh, vacuum is just a little bit too strong, we'll go about eight inches of mercury. Um, between eight and nine, it'll fluctuate right there. Uh, if it happens to sneak up around 10 or 12, it could actually squeeze the ends of these two plenums together, right? Because the foam, there's nothing to keep the foam from squeezing in. So a couple of tips that I've learned is put the uh, balsa around, remember we've got our hinge balsa back here on the back. Uh, obviously it's not gonna collapse that, but it can collapse the foam. The vacuum is so strong that it will actually bend this MDF just a little bit, the, the tiniest bit, and of course it flexes back once you pull the pressure off of it, uh, but it will bend it enough that it will collapse that foam. So be careful not to run your vacuum up too high. About eight inches of mercury is enough, uh, but just in case, I have taken a uh, uh, just a piece of the, the uh, uh, 5 sixteenths uh, balsa that we used for the end and I put a 1 16th on the outside of that. Remember that would represent our um, spine going across the back and one of these sheets rather than one on either side uh, and that makes these two spacers 1 16th of an inch shorter than our slabs here or our parts and um, that will keep this from collapsing. Now of course the vacuum is going to squeeze it in just a little bit um, but that, and we want that pressure, right? But we don't want any more than about a sixteenth of an inch total. And of course that foam will bounce back from a sixteenth very easily. I have done pieces where um, I didn't put these spacers in and I cranked my vacuum up around 12 or 14, thinking that, you know, if, if eight or 10 is good, 12, 14 is probably better. Um, and uh, I ruined my piece because it collapsed the foam and the foam did not come back. So uh, don't get lured into doing that. I've made sure that I don't have any epoxy on top of or on the bottom of these parts, otherwise I would stick them to this. Every now and then I'll put wax paper down, um, but if you're diligent about keeping uh, epoxy off the top of it, you shouldn't have any problem. I almost got ahead of myself just a little bit. Um, we want to make sure that we put some tape across the seam before we put these in the vacuum bag. So that will keep that uh, epoxy from pulling through that, that seam there. It's supposed to be done before, um, I mean, as soon as you put your little tabs on there, uh, you put it on, so. Otherwise, that epoxy will pull through that little gap, that little seam there. Uh, not a gap, it's, a, it's just a seam. And it will stick your part to the, the MDF, and that's not a good thing. So, no worries. Caught that before we vacuum bagged it up. And we'll fold this up. And we'll put two rounds of tape uh, all the way around, and that will uh, protect the bag. And that'll be enough. Uh, and the reason we put those rounds of tape uh, is to, one, keep the bag from being pulled into this gap on the end. Uh, it won't pull in here because obviously the part is blocking it from going in, but our parts are only about this long, so that leaves us that amount of gap that uh, the bag could get pulled in and, and stretch the bag just a little bit right there, and that's not a good thing. So just to help the bag, help the bag there. And secondly, uh, those little fiberglass, um, little pieces of fiberglass strands that are sticking out the sides right there. They're very soft and pliable right now, but um, uh, because they've got the epoxy on them, they're wet and they lay down nicely. So we put this tape on there and that lays them down so that they don't become little needles and can stick in the bag. So let's throw this rascal in the bag. Oh, and I want to uh, just poke a few holes in the end so that the uh, air can get pulled out.
Then I just take a piece of, uh, this is just a piece of burlap, and uh, it will help the uh, air travel across the top of that MDF uh, down into the bag or down into the, uh, the part there. I have some uh, uh, very elaborate cloths that I use uh, when I'm building furniture, but that's a much, much higher uh, level of inches of mercury. And we're gonna be running at uh, eight to nine inches of mercury, and that's not gonna have any problem at all getting, getting through here. So uh, just a simple piece of burlap or, or a piece of uh, cloth doubled over will be fine. A towel, I've used a towel before. Just something to give that air something to travel through because this plastic, or uh, the polyurethane will get pulled down onto uh, the MDF strong enough that it's difficult for the, the air to escape. So um, that's all that is. And, and there's a piece of paper towel stuck on top of it that acts as a filter there. Call that one 2 p.m. And in three hours, we'll take that out of the bag. And it'll cycle uh, two or three times as it's pulling the foam down. And then once it gets the air out, it'll run, I don't know, 15 or 20 minutes between cycles. And it'll run uh, probably three, maybe four seconds just to uh, get it back up to nine inches of mercury there. So it should come on here in just a second. There we go, so it looked like it came on at what, seven and then clicked back off at nine. So it'll probably do one more cycle like that and then uh, hold for at least 15 minutes. So here is, uh, one of our parts that just came out of the, uh, the vacuum bag, I had, had already um, done this one time before but didn't have the audio, so I'll, I'll do it one time again. Uh, the tape comes off pretty easy. Just takes a little bit of time. I am always amazed at how nice these come, these things come out to be. I don't know if you can see just how straight that is. Incredibly straight. Um, and we are very uniform, it looks like, from one end to the other. So 10.87. 10 10.92. 10.94, 10.98-ish. So that is 10.86. This is the back side, of course. It's gonna be standard all the way across. So that's nice. Uh, turns out we're just a tad wider on the front uh, than we are in the back. So uh, maybe our, our uh, spacers didn't need to be quite that thick. We could have gone down another couple of thousandths with them. But that's pretty darn close now. Because uh, remember, we're talking a tenth of a millimeter, which is awfully small. So, next thing we need to do is uh, attach this thing with tape to our template. And we want to take the trailing edge, which is the one with the balsa in it, right? And let it hang over the template, probably a 32nd of an inch or so, because remember we don't want to lose a lot of our half inch um, balsa block there that our hinges are going to go in. So just a, a very minimal of that, just to clean it up. So maybe a 32nd or a 64th, if you could get that close, just enough that when the router shaves by it, it cleans it. And that's all we're going to need. So 
So we'll take a piece of tape on either side, clamp it down tight, let it hang over just a tad, not much at all, just enough that we can tell it's hanging over. Attach it good and then do the same thing to the front. Or just attach it on the front. Okay, now we're not going to attach the ends yet um, because, as a matter of fact, let me go ahead and, and trim, since we're standing right here at the bandsaw, let me go ahead and trim this right here just a tiny bit. Now we could have done that uh, with the router, it would have been fine, it's just a little more meat that the router doesn't have to worry about. Uh, being the foam, it's not going to be that big a deal on the router, but since we're standing right here at it, let's use it. Uh, and I'm hanging out about an eighth of an inch. Uh, kind of interesting to, uh, to see just how strong this stuff is. Um, gosh, it's, it's pretty strong. You can break it. Uh, there's a good example. All right now, it did not break all the way through and it did not break the fiberglass. So if you had a, a incident where perhaps you folded over and, and uh, uh, folded the rudder or, or one of the elevators or something like that, uh, I have on occasion, I did it one time about a year ago, uh, taken some foam safe CA, just injected into that, straighten it back out. It, it's still pretty strong. Um, even after that, that fracture, it's, it's still incredibly strong. Take some foam safe CA, fill that crack, get it all mushed back in the right position. Uh, and then my intention that day was just to fly it the rest of the day. And then, um, uh, you know, put another part in it the, the following week for the next weekend. But, um, I flew the plane for about another year, uh, and ended up just crashing it here recently. So, um, I don't see that tail sitting here. Um. But anyway, uh, again, uh, a uh, testament to how strong and durable this material is, or this build process is. All right, and the reason I'm not putting tape on the ends is we're going to trim the ends first uh, on the router table and then we will uh, tape from the ends and trim the rest and handle the rest.
Okay, so we're going to do the vertical assembly uh, pretty much exactly like we did the horizontal, so we don't have to go through all of those steps, but there are a couple of tips that I want to, uh, to relay here. Ultimately, this is the part that we want to make. Um, we want it to have that shape right there. Um, but it's got some components that go in it. We have, of course, our uh, hinge support, our hinge block here. This uh, half inch hinge block, remember that's eight millimeters thick. And we've got a um, balsa block is in here. And that holds the control horn uh, for the rudder. And it just distributes that load out there. For uh, the first three or four versions of this plane, I did not put this piece in. Uh, I just let the, the piece go through the, the control horn, the, the pull pull, or the uh, push pull from the uh, control horn there, from the servo, go through the foam. And it did fine, but after, uh, I don't know, after six months or so, it started getting a little bit loose, I noticed, uh, and I would have to tighten it up. Ultimately, I put the foam safe CA in there, and, and uh, that plane flew for a good while longer. But a way to avoid that is just to put a balsa block in there, and that helps distribute that load and handles the crush uh, forces from that uh, servo horn there or that uh, control horn. So I have uh, gone to this and that's the way that I like to do it. Doesn't really matter how big this piece is. I chose, uh, I don't know, whatever that is, two inches by maybe an inch and, and a quarter or inch and three eighths there, maybe an inch and a half. So it, it doesn't, that's just an arbitrary size there. I, I literally held it up and said that ought to go about right. Um, and I chose for the grain to go this way. Uh, that way I get some more of the assistance from that grain there. The strength from the grain is not as, as um, prone to pop off. Now I also elected for this block to come all the way to the end here. And the reason was the hole for this control horn is going to be right behind uh, that line right here where this glues uh, our hinge blocks glue on. Uh, we don't need the support uh, of this piece right here because of course it's tied in um, with the hinges so we don't really have any twisting uh, or flex right there that we have to worry about. So we're not worried about a long piece running there like we would here. Uh, so we can split that up into as many little pieces as we want. So I, rather than having that hole right on where that glue seam right there would be, I chose to uh, just have this piece exit all the way out the back there. Uh, and that is real easy to, to cut on the bandsaw. I just stack a bunch of these up. Uh, and again, any size bandsaw will make that cut. I don't know if you could see. Um, I decided that that's about in this area right here. That's about where I want that control horn hole to be. Uh, so I just cut me out a, a, uh, um, a piece of foam there just two slices in with the bandsaw. Of course, they go straight through this whole stack of, uh, it looks to be six of them there, so I did six at one time. And I will cut these out individually with an X-Acto knife and a straight edge uh, when I get ready to uh, sheet that or when I get ready to glue that piece in. And of course, it just uh, five minute epoxies in just like we're, we're used to doing now. So uh, another trick that, that we need to um, pass on here or that I need to pass on is Remember, ultimately, this is the size of the part that we want, but we want to be a little bit oversized so that we can trim down just like we did for the horizontal parts. Well, there's a little bit of a complication there because we don't want to trim into this piece and we need to allow for that half inch. So the question is how to draw our part so that we can allow um, for this piece here. Uh, and the best way that I have found to do it is just to set, set your uh, piece up on a block of foam, find whatever straight edge you want to, uh, to use uh, just to help yourself out. And let's use this up here. And take a Sharpie and just trace the little rascal out. Just for reference, I'll put a couple of these holes in. You certainly don't have to trace these holes out, but that'll help us picture what it's going to look like. Of 
All right, so that's what our piece is going to look like. Um, well, that's the size it will look like ultimately. But remember, we want to go just a little bit wider. So let's give ourselves maybe a half inch on the back. And we should have allowed to come down for a half inch on the top, but uh, I just didn't do that, my mistake. And then we'll allow for maybe a half inch up here and a half inch right here. But uh, we don't want to add a half here because ultimately our part uh, will be just a little bit smaller there because we've got this piece of half inch here. So let's leave that side where it is and actually come in. A half inch and put a line right there. Now that is the actual size. So we'll need to make sure that we're very precise with that or at least we're pretty darn close in the ballpark um, because that's what we that's what we're going to need that extra half inch right there and when we line it up just like we did the uh, trailing edge on the horizontal when we line this up on this template we will just make sure that we line that up as close as we can remember we allowed like a 16th or, or excuse me a, a 64th or a 32nd there uh, and we just will shave that to make sure that we're 90 degrees in, in all of those things that we need to be and that our sizes are right. So um, that's the only, the only real trick there. Um, and I can, I can slide that down about an eighth inch and still make that work. So I'll have an eighth inch up here to uh, trim away. Uh, and another thing that we can do while we're here is put a half inch down here for the uh, bottom piece. For a long time, I wasn't putting a half inch piece down here at the bottom, this piece here, uh, and I never had any problem uh, structurally. Uh, it's just the way that I like to play with the plane. I like to drag the tail across the ground. Um, <laughs> I know a lot of guys out there are laughing at me, go, why in the world would you do that? It, it's just fun. It's one of those things that I like to do uh, because I can. Um, and I found that if I don't have something down here that's a little more beefy than the foam and the balsa, after a while, particularly dragging it across the asphalt, I was rounding this back edge right there real bad. And it was getting a little bit frayed and I, I would put some five minute epoxy on it and it'd last me, you know, another month. Uh, but after a while I realized, you know what, why don't I, in, why don't I go ahead and put the strip here and that will also, um, because of the tail wheel that I use, I use a tiller type tail wheel, which has a pin that runs up through here from the bottom. So the wire comes here and uh, it, it turns the tail wheel like that. So this will also give me a little bit more support for that tail wheel tiller pin that runs up through there. Uh, and it just gets five minute epoxy in later on. So aside from those uh, little deviations, and that's not very complicated, uh, just a tip on how I found to do it. Ultimately, all you want to do is make sure you allow to put um, these parts in. In my opinion, these are critical uh, after my trial and error. Uh, this one's optional. If you're not going to be dragging your tail down the ground, I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, but uh, it does beefen that tail up an awful lot. Uh, so, you know, not a bad idea. And ultimately you can round this over, or put an octagon shape on it. I've even changed some of mine up. I don't have one right here that is a different shape where um, I have, you know, just rounded that over or put like an, uh, uh, an octagon shape there. So your imagination is the limit there, how you want to design your rudder. Uh, it's just, I would make sure that you get these elements in there because that is something from trial and error that I found. Uh, can cause problems later on down the road. So next tip, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. The uh, um, sheeting. We want to run the sheeting on diagonals and you can see that I have already um, glued this or not glued but uh, taped this sheeting up and it runs on you know about a 45 degree diagonal. Now one tip 
um, and invariably I screw up and, and, and make too many rights or too many lefts and not enough lefts and, and, or not enough rights. So uh, there is a right and a left, uh, obviously, um, because uh, the pieces have shapes. So you see the, the inside there and then, of course, the outside. And they are mirror image of each other, of course. So keep that in mind when you're tracing out, uh, when you, and, and what I did was I stacked out, um, a, I ultimately ended up with a big sheet about this big. Um, and it was probably five of these things, five three strip, three inch strips tall. And, um, I lay them all out, get a big, big sheet taped up, just like we did on our wing, a full sheet taped up. And then I would take this uh, piece and line it to where the grain goes at 45 degree diagonals, and then just keep shifting it to where I can maximize the number of pieces I'm gonna get out of that one sheet, uh, and also maintain my diagonal grain. So I would get like four or five of these out of one sheet with very, very minimal waste, but uh, you are gonna end up with some waste if you uh, want to have the diagonal grain, and I think that's very, very important. So make sure that um, you trace some, and if you wanna put a right and a left on, on your template, uh, remember we're tracing about a half inch larger, right? Uh, and I actually use, um, and you can see where I've been drawn. I use that as uh, my template because that's the oversized part, right? So uh, just make sure that you have a right and a left and you know do three rights or, or two rights and then two lefts and, and you should have enough parts there. So tip is there's a right and a left. Make sure you get the right number of each. Okay, so we're ready to put the uh, triangle stock trim around the outside. Pretty straightforward. We've done this before on, on other uh, applications, but there are a couple of tips that um, are, are worth mentioning here. Uh, one, and this is just 3 8 uh, triangle stock. It gives me just a little bit of overhang on either side, which is, is going to be enough, so I won't have to do a lot of uh, sanding to get that shaped and, and such. Um, one of the tips that uh, uh, I have learned, since I am bad about dragging um, this uh, horizontal stab down the runway and, and being goofy and, and doing all kinds of weird stuff, I have found that if I run the top piece of trim, the leading edge piece of trim, past, um, in other words, go over the piece that's on the side, that way I'm less prone to snag the side piece uh, because obviously the grain is running uh, this way here, and anything that, that drags that way will, will snag that trim and try to splinter it. So just let your top piece hang over, and the end grain of this piece will help protect that. Of course, we're gonna round it with sandpaper and all that business, but still, um, the, the asphalt runway or even grass runway will, will grab that and splinter it back. On the uh, back, it doesn't make any difference because, of course, it's concealed by the elevator that's gonna come over here but we would want to do the same thing on the back of the elevator. Uh, in that case, we would let the side piece extend past the, uh, the trailing edge piece so that it can protect the trailing edge side. Aside from that, it's uh, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're just gonna epoxy them on, of course, using a lot of lightning, a, a lot of uh, uh, micro balloons to lighten that epoxy up a whole lot. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and cut these pieces up and we'll get them glued on. So I'm going to put the side pieces on first, uh, take them down and then uh, trim and then I'll put the top piece on. 
All right, so I've just glued up some scrap pieces of a scrap piece of plywood with a uh, drill to hole so I can hang it uh, with some scrap MDF and spaced it just far enough apart that I can get these pieces in here like this. So nothing, nothing special to that at all. That's too high. And again, this is a, a super light. Gosh, I can hardly even tell that's out there. Uh, I, I've probably got that three to one or even four to one micro balloons there. And that'll sand real nicely too. And again, uh, you can't lighten uh, Gorilla Glue or any of the other glues. So this is why, I, one of the reasons I prefer using epoxy here. And I'm going to let that stick up just a little bit high. So we'll use our sanding block and sand it down flat here in just a little bit. So that we can put our top piece on. Now this is not... Uh, Scotch tape, um, I'm not gonna name what it is, but it is not, it's uh, one of the other brands that was given to me. So we'll see how it does. The Scotch painter's tape is what I actually prefer. just to ensure that we have the same amount of overhang on either side. And now that we've got it taped on real nicely, we'll use the uh, sanding block to gently, doesn't take much at all. change the profile of our piece here and that's nice and smooth Okay, so I have put um, at least twice as much tape as I usually have to. Uh, I'm not a fan of this tape at all. Uh, I much prefer my Scotch tape, but again, this was uh, given to me, but um, I, I think I'm gonna take it back and swap it out for the tape that I actually like. And I'll put a link to that tape uh, in the comments section below so that everybody knows uh, what to get. I'm not gonna mention this tape, of course. Um, but I have tried several types of tape and I have settled on one particular type. Uh, I forget the number, but it's the Scotch brand and, and I'll put the part number or the, the item number uh, down below. So I'm gonna let this uh, uh, cure and then I will sand uh, this little area up here and put that little tiny piece uh, right there just to, to bridge that little bit of a gap. I don't think it's even needed because it's, it's completely hidden uh, or it, I think it's just about completely hidden uh, up under the fuse, so we'll have to double check that. And if it is, I'll just uh, extend it just far enough to get under the fuse. No big deal at all. So uh, I'll let this dry and um, come back in a little bit and, and sand it flat. Okay, so I have put the uh, 3 8 banding strip, uh, triangle strip around the outside of our uh, horizontal here, and it really stiffened it up a lot, so uh, I, I really like that. And I'm just gonna leave the corners and edges sharp right now. And once I put the elevators on and I, and I get everything uh, fitted together, then I'll take a, um, 
uh, sand and block with uh, probably 150 or, or 220 grit and kind of round that and ease the corners just a little bit. But I don't want to do it yet because uh, when I put the elevators on, uh, I want to make sure that everything lines up just right and we'll take advantage of all that meat there uh, when we're sanding to blend those together. So we don't want to do that yet. Uh, and also I have put the, uh, um, uh, remember it left a little uh, flat spot at the front. That's not that big a deal because that's where our, our fuselage is, of course. Um, but just to cover that and to, to make it blend and look real good, uh, I put a piece of triangle stock across the top and just five minute epoxy it down with some micro balloons, of course. And I will take um, uh, this sand, sanding block here and sand that to where it blends. Uh, if you can see now, you can still see the, the triangle sticking up. It literally just takes seconds to blend this down. And don't go too much because this coarse sandpaper will really go into our part quickly. Uh, it's probably safer to go to the, the finer grit and just spend a few seconds more. So that's all it took for that side right there. So be very careful with the coarse sandpaper. the fine sandpaper. And then you can see how nicely that turns out. Um, boy, that really does look good. I, I can't tell if you can see how well that looks. Boy, I can't, I can hardly even see where that piece is in there. Hmm. Okay, and I think I was just a little bit over ambitious in thinking that I could get um, the tail section is done in, in two episodes. Uh, it's obviously going to take three. So uh, uh, I tried to uh, edit out as much of this episode as I could to get it short enough to get everything fit in. But there's a lot of tips in there that, that we really need to uh, need to explain so the guys don't have to come back and ask those questions on uh, either the website or the Facebook forum later on. Uh, what we want to do next is um, Obviously, off camera, I will finish these up. Uh, no need to go through all that. We've, we've seen that. Uh, and we want to join our two elevator halves together. And to do that, we'll make an aluminum joiner plate. Um, you're welcome to use whatever, obviously, use whatever uh, joiner system you want. Most uh, planes use a wire, a music wire um, uh, joiner shaped like a U or, or squared off U. And it, it obviously comes. Uh, you know, sticks up into the elevator there, comes across, and then goes up in here. Um, I have found those problematic in the past because they just don't give enough rigidity. Uh, you can, obviously, we, we only are running um, one elevator servo. If we were running two, it wouldn't be that big a deal. It wouldn't be an issue at all, right? Uh, but since we're just running one, all of our torque is on this side and going through that joiner there. And I find that the wire twist and uh, during precision maneuvers, you notice that the, the plane will try to spiral just a little bit, and that is because um, one of these elevators is moving just a little bit more than the other. The alternative that I have found works well for me is using a 1 16th aluminum plate. Uh, it's about the same weight because it's aluminum compared to the steeled wire. Uh, may even be a little bit lighter, but because we are so much wider, uh, you're not going to flex that plate. It, it's just it's just not going to flex like a piece of wire will, uh, even though the wire is pretty thick. Uh, and you get more support, more glue area as it is glued to the elevator rather than just running into that shaft. Now I have not had one of these come off at all, and I have uh, I have some of these uh, horizontal sections that have uh, been in crashed planes. Uh, where I broke the fuselage and I just literally just peel them off of here, peel the, the what's left of the fuselage off like I'll do with this plane ultimately uh, and take this tail and put it in another plane. And I've got some of these tail sections that have been in, um, you know, two or three planes now, uh, certainly three planes, maybe even four. I think, um, I think that yellow one up there has been in, actually in four fuselages so far um, and I could put it in another one. It, it's still in very, very good shape. So, um, this in this episode here, and in the next episode, we will work on these plates uh, and, of course, join the two elevator halves together, drill our hinges. Uh, don't need to see all of that, but we'll do that very briefly. 
and uh, cut this um, groove or this slot in the fuselage to accept our elevator and we'll discuss uh, some of the issues we need to consider about exactly where you want to put your, your elevator. It doesn't really matter, it's up to you. Um, it's your design, you can do it whichever way you want, uh, but there's some things that you want to plan for and keep in mind, like a uh, hinge basement and room for the tail wheel and, and all of those things. So I will see you in the next episode and uh, I will get started on all of these parts and have them ready to go.